Well, welcome everybody. It's so great to have you in class today. Today is a very special week. It is Civil Rights Week, and we are having class today all about the civil rights movement. And if you haven't been in our Friday classes before, they are some of my favorites because we get to bring in guest speakers and ask them tons of questions. So as you go through class, I'll be in the chat with you, helping you out and monitoring your questions in the Q&A or the chat. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And we are going to go through this conversation with the amazing Professor Jeffrey. So a little bit about Professor Jeffrey. You know, I reread your bio, Professor Jeffries, and I'm always impressed. And I just wanted to make sure I was getting everything in here today. So um, the, this week, we really dive into the civil rights movement and its presence over time in America. So Professor Jeffries is at Ohio State University. He has a PhD in American history with a focus on the civil rights movement and the Black Power movement. Um, he also really prides himself, and I love this line, so I'm stealing it. He prides himself on opening minds of new ways of understanding the past and the present. And we love that. And I knew that Jeff Rosen would love that as well. So I wanted to add that in there. You are also an amazing writer. You helped Mount Pillar, James Madison's um, home, to reinterpret the way they tell stories about American history and uh, stories about the Bill of Rights and Madison. So there's several books that you might want to check out. I have this awesome one right here about teaching the civil rights movement. Um, but when I was thinking about your bio and all the great work you did, I kept thinking about Jeff Rosen, our CEO and president who will be leading this conversation today, one of his favorite lines. And it is, come let us reason together. So without any further ado, I'm gonna ping it over to Jeff Rosen. Thank you so much, Curry, and welcome, Professor Jeffries. We're so honored to have you today and all of us have been so looking forward to this conversation. You have such an amazing background and your books are so illuminating. And I thought we would jump right in and begin with the topic of your important volume, Understanding and Teaching the Civil mm -hmm. Rights Movement. Here in this class, we have talked about how the civil rights movement was essential to fulfilling the promise of the Constitution. That promise enshrined in the Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution, which tried to make real the uh, promise of the Declaration of Independence, thwarted by Southern redemption, but then resurrected by the civil rights movement beginning in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and culminating in Brown versus Board of Education in the 1960s. When, when, you, when you teach the constitutional dimension of the civil rights movement, what do you teach and how should we understand the constitutional dimension of the civil rights movement. Well, first, Jeffrey, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be a part of this conversation uh, and this dialogue. Uh, you at the and your whole team at the National Constitution Center do such wonderful work. Uh, and it's so timely and important uh, at this moment, not only for students, but also for uh, teachers. And, I can, and I'm a teacher as well to continue to be a part of this dialogue and to think uh, constantly about Sort of the Constitution and and our and its applicability and how we can understand and frame and and, and make the most of it. So I'm really delighted to be here with you uh, and with everyone today. You know, when when I think about sort of the civil rights movement, you know, one of the and really and putting it as you said, sort of the modern civil rights movement of the 20s, 30s, 40s, and reaching this sort of height in the 1960s, 1970s. But it is really part of a uh, a continuum of black protest, an African-American freedom struggle. Uh, and before 1865, um, it's African-Americans trying to gain a literal freedom. And after 1865, it's African-Americans trying to gain uh, what I call freedom rights, this combination of civil rights and human rights. And in order to obtain that, uh, they are constantly trying to give meaning to the constitution and have it apply to them. And of course, 1857 in the Dred Scott ruling, Chief Just uh, Justice Roger Taney says, uh, African-Americans have no rights which the white man is bound to respect. Uh, and so that sets up this tension uh, where African-Americans, and as you mentioned during the Reconstruction Act, the Reconstruction Amendments, you know, are trying to say, wait, <laughs> waving our hand, like, hey, this applies to us. <laughs> like, hey, how does this work, right? And then, you know, it being reinterpreted and pulled back. And then black folk 
you know, both attorneys, Charles Hamilton Houston, one of the, you know, the, 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 the chief architect of the Brown decision. Um, so you have lawyers, civil rights lawyers who are trying to interpret it in a way that applies to everyone, that applies to black folk to protect and uh, African-American rights. And then, and so, so that, in, so we often think about a law or the constitution or an amendment as being put down and can only be interpreted one way. Uh, but what black folk are saying like, wait a minute, you know, when this was written, we were excluded. We were not included. But part of the beauty is it's written in such universal language that when the times change, then the applicability needs to change as well. And so I think just when we, when we think about the civil rights movement as it relates to the constitution, I think we have to think about the ways in which the movement, one of the primary objectives of the movement is to get the constitution to apply to everyone. And that, and there's some other things, but when it comes to the law and the constitution, that is really, at, really one of the key goals of all the work that was being done. That is such a powerful way of encapsulating our topic. And as you say, that central goal of the freedom movement, as you so powerfully call it, to get the constitution to apply to everyone was fought not just in the civil rights movement that preceded uh, the emancipation, it uh, postdated it, and it was an ongoing struggle of the generations. I wanna ask about um, the, competing role of the right to vote as opposed to judicial struggles, as opposed to agitation of people um, who marched and protest. Uh, Frederick Douglass called the right to vote a kind of king's cure for discrimination. And yet, of course, the right to vote promised in the 15th Amendment was thwarted almost immediately by redemption and by literacy tests and poll taxes. It took almost a hundred years to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, give us a sense of how central the struggle for the right to vote was. And was that the primary engine of success of the civil rights movement or was it an interaction of the right to vote and those other factors, judicial victories, as well as political protest? Well, you call the name of Frederick Douglass and of course the great abolitionist and the freedom fighter born in slavery escapes uh, and then spends his life fighting for um, basic civil rights and human rights for African-Americans. In 1865, Frederick Douglass, on the heels of emancipation, on the heels of uh, the abolition of slavery says, so this is five years before the 15th amendment is ratified, says, says freedom is meaningless without the vote for African-Americans. I mean, so he understood the centrality of the vote and, and not just the vote to be able to have it, but the vote as a way to have a say in the decisions that affect and impact a person's life and impact people's lives, impact the lives of African-Americans. You can't be a full citizen uh, and participate fully uh, in this government, in the society, unless you have access to the ballot box, which also means have being able to run for political office and then being able to have a say in the decisions that uh, affect society. And, and as you pointed out as well, you know, almost as soon as black folk get the vote is stripped from them. Right. And so we begin to see this wave of uh, constitutions in the South uh, or, or, or rewriting of state constitutions in the South to include, as you pointed out, Jeffrey, the literacy tests and these uh, poll tax and all these other things. I think it's important to point out, too, at that moment, two things. One, all of those mechanisms never mention race. So they're colorblind. Right. So after the colorblind measures that discriminate against African-Americans. So we don't need and this is important for all students to understand just because a law uh, does not mention race does not mean one that it does not have discriminatory intent in its creation and two that it cannot have a discriminatory impact because all of those measures and every state constitution in the former Confederacy rewrites uh, its constitution for the sole purpose of disenfranchising African-Americans, none of them mentioned race because you can't because of the 15th and the 14th amendments, but they all had that purpose. And two, so that's one thing. And then two, what happens as well is not only do you get this wave of disenfranchisement mechanisms taking the vote away from African-Americans by law, but it's enforced by violence. And it's this racial terrorism that keeps African-Americans from organizing publicly for the vote in the South. So, you know, once these constitutions hit, 
like you know, after Reconstruction, African Americans, uh, or, or during Reconstruction, the Fifteenth Amendment, African American men, remember, only African American men are able to vote with the Fifteenth Amendment. They flock to the voter registration. Uh, they, they flock to register to vote and to vote. And so there's this period in the, in the early 1970s, and in many places into the into the early 1870s, and in many places into the early 1880s, where African Americans are just voting in mass in the South. But then once these reconstruct, once these redemption, once these new constitution, uh, state constitutions uh, drop these laws, then suddenly you see a precipitous decline. The state of Alabama in 1901 uh, rewrites his state constitution. And in the small county, Lowndes County, Alabama, which is 80% African-American at the time in between Selma and Montgomery, that county drops from 5,000 registered voters in 1901 to black voters to 50 in 1905. And the reason why you don't see African-Americans marching on the county courthouse is not because they suddenly gave up on the vote. They still understood what Frederick Douglass knew. It's because if they showed up, they would likely be killed. It was that racial terrorism that was so critical to understanding this disenfranchisement. So when we fast forward to 1965 and we get the movement to regain the right to vote, Black folk didn't just suddenly wake up because Martin Luther King said, this is an important thing that we have to do. The, 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 the conditions and the circumstances had changed where it was still dangerous to try to register, but at least people wouldn't be killed simply by showing up at the county courthouse. That is so powerful. And you mentioned uh, uh, Lowndes County, uh, Alabama. And of course you wrote an important book Bloody Lowndes, Civil Rights and Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt, which tells the story of the freedom movement in Lowndes County, that which you call the birthplace of black power. That's just amazing because of course, as you write, the central voting rights case of that era, Giles v. Harris from 1903, is this shameful US Supreme Court decision where Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes essentially said there may be massive disenfranchisement of African-Americans but if this fraud actually exists on this scale that the plaintiffs allege, there's nothing the court can do to stop it. So tell us more about that Giles and Harris case, what you learned in the course of your research in Lowndes County and what that teaches us, that Giles and Harris case about the unwillingness of courts, uh, you know, until the 1950s and 60s to begin to look beyond the face of the law and to scrutinize its actual intent. Well, sometimes when we think, let, let, let's move forward in time a little bit and then go back. Because one of the things that we do when we study the civil rights movement and we talk and teach about the civil rights movement is we put the federal government squarely on the side of freedom, right? I mean, we look at, and particularly the courts, right? And so we think uh, our, our mind is immediately taken to the Brown decision and we say, hey, the Supreme Court was on the right side of history and we get the Brown decision. Uh, and that's fantastic. And then there are a number of uh, you know, federal cases dealing with school desegregation and the like. And so the courts do play this major role uh, in shifting the way in which um, we think about racial discrimination and providing supports and protections for African-Americans. But the court is dragged there and that's critically important. And of course, before we have uh, Giles v. Harris, we have Plessy v. Ferguson, I mean, which is the other sort of a uh, real anchor when we think about segregation and Jim Crow. But Giles v. Harris is really important because it's not just like we see in Plessy v. Ferguson, this sort of bad decision, right? It's like, well, you know, segregation, as long as it's equal, it's okay. Giles v. Harris is the abdication of responsibility. And that, is, and in a way that's almost worse because it's an admission, right? So in, in Plessy, the, the court says the majority court, uh, the majority of the court seven to one says, you know, we think that segregation is actually fine. In Giles v. Harris, it's like, you know, disenfranchisement, you know, is actually wrong, but we don't think we can do anything about it. Like that is horrible, right? So it's like, it's like, you know, it's wrong. You're saying it's wrong. You just spent the last quarter century distinguishing between sort of civil rights and political rights, saying we have to protect political rights. That's sort of a different area, a different venue. We got to protect that, the high court. And then you get Giles v. Harris and they're like, yeah, nothing we can do about that. Good luck. And, and, and so that is actually then giving, one, it's reflecting what the reality that was on the ground. And that was disenfranchisement was just a, a tsunami 
that was just sweeping across the United States, sweeping across the South. And it's an acknowledgement that that was happening. It's an acknowledgement that that was wrong. But then it's saying that, you know, there's nothing we, it's, if it's really that bad, there's nothing we can do about it. Well, you know, the enforcement certainly comes from the executive branch, but you're not even saying that you should try. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's terrible. So, you know, it's important because of that, but it's also, I think, a good case because it points out that the, the, the court, the courts and the Supreme Court in particular, you know, had to be brought along. It was not always on the side of, you know, ex, uh, of democracy and extending and protecting democracy and was willing to give up that in the name of preserving, in a, in, in a sense, sort of white racial unity, because that was what was being um, uh, brought together by the disenfranchisement of African-Americans North and South. The courts had to be brought along. That is such a powerful way of putting it. Uh, and eventually, uh, thanks to the heroic efforts of advocates like uh, Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston and others, we had Brown versus Board of Education and the civil rights revolution in the courts. I wanna ask you about racially terrorized violence, as you called mm. it, mob violence. The founders of the Constitution are centrally concerned about demagogues who inflame mobs to attack the federal and state courthouses because they don't want to pay their debts. Then in the years leading up to and after the Civil War, racist mobs who are committing terror, lynching people, uh, killing them, are denounced by Abraham Lincoln during his Springfield oration. and But they continue and they're tolerated you know, almost until the 1950s and 60s. What was it that brought the courts along and led them, instead of tolerating this mob violence, eventually to insist on stopping it? Oh, sorry, you're muted. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I got so caught up in the question. I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> sorry, I'm thinking I, of I, I want to hear the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what we, I was saying, when we think about the courts, Sometimes the court is leading and sometimes the court is following. You know, and in that sense, sometimes the court is just a reflection of the larger society. Uh, and, and very often that is actually the case. And so when it comes to sort of the courts and racial terrorism and racial violence, too often, and, and when it's politically driven and politically motivated, too often, once again, the court is sort of following. The court is reflecting where the sentiment was. You know, we, we just had this, this terrible scene, this terrible uh, attempt to halt the, the regular process of democracy on, on, on January 6th. That was political violence. And many people were, were shocked and I was shocked too, but I wasn't surprised in the sense that we actually have a long history of political violence in the United States that is connected to this belief that democracy is going to undermine white supremacy. And that's what we actually saw. And that's what all of this, whether you're talking about sort of the Colfax massacre, uh, which happens in Louisiana in 1873, or uh, Wilmington in 1898. I mean, these are actual political coups in which the courts will just step aside and they won't, and they, and they won't intervene. What changes though uh, down the road? Uh, one has a lot to do with the changing in public sentiment and the willingness of African-Americans to raise it as an issue because it doesn't go away. But what happens is you have African-Americans on the ground in these places who are saying, whether it's in Selma, Alabama or Birmingham, that, that what, what the senators, uh, Senator Eastland in Mississippi is saying that the reason why African-Americans don't vote is because they're not interested in participating in the political process is not true and it's not and the evidence of that becomes those demonstrations for voting rights that are captured on camera so that the nation as a whole can see that violence and racial terror is what's keeping african americans from the ballot box whether that is freedom summer during mississippi or bloody sunday or, or bloody sunday in selma alabama and there I, by sort of drawing that out showing that not just Jim Crow is violent, but disenfranchisement is violent, is predicated on violence, then forces the hand of the government to say, you know what, we can't turn a blind eye to this anymore. This 
actually is unconstitutional, keeping people from participating uh, in the political process, keeping them from uh, casting ballots or registering to vote. So making it public, changing public opinion, not completely, but just enough, meant that the courts could no longer turn a blind eye, that what they were seeing clearly was, were violations of the Constitution, were violations of the 14th Amendment, interfering with people's right uh, to participate freely and unfettered in an unfettered way in the uh, political process, denying them those basic citizenship rights. They couldn't turn a blind eye to that anymore by the time we got to the midpoint of the 20th century. That is such a powerful point. And you put it so clearly, it was the photos captured on camera that changed public opinion and changed the course of history. The Selma Bridge, Bloody Sunday. We talked in class about the picture of the police dogs being set on the kids. That fundamentally changed public opinion. And more recently, we saw that the George Floyd video fundamentally transformed the debate. Is it, say more about how crystallizing moments captured in images can be the, literally the most important uh, force in changing public opinion about civil rights. It's been critical and it's been critical for a long time. I mean, we can go back to the era of slavery and we think about um, those, those uh, slave narratives. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, problematic, yes, but what it did was draw attention to these problems, to the horrors of disenfranchisement, to the horrors of racial terrorism, to the horrors of segregation. So, you know, African Americans, whether we're talking about um, a cell phone camera today capturing police violence, or we're talking about a narrative by a fugitive, by a runaway, a, a freedom seeker, someone who uh, stole away to freedom and talks about the horrors of slavery, African Americans don't need that to know that there's a problem. Uh, but we live in a society and have lived for, the so, for so long in which we downplay uh, and often uh, ignore the persistence of inequality and that this inequality is in fact predicated based upon violence and is a form of violence itself. And so when we get these moments where the curtain is pulled back and we see what discrimination actually is, that moves people. Now, it's a shame that you just can't take a word for it, right? That, that hey, there's a problem. Uh, and that it takes this, literally the, the people to sacrifice their lives, to give, to lose their lives so that the attention can be drawn to this. But history tells us that that has been the case. And so when we look back, there are these moments, just as you pointed out, Jeffrey, whether it's George Floyd uh, or, or Ferguson uh, or you know, Selma, Alabama or Birmingham, where the nation and often the world pauses and says, wait a minute, one, we didn't know it was this bad. And two, this has to change. Something has to change. Uh, and so public opinion is critical, is absolutely critical. Uh, now, you're not going to change everybody's mind. You might not even change half the country's mind, but you can change the minds of enough people by letting them know what's going on to get significant change. And we saw that during the civil rights era. So interesting. In law school, uh, I, like my fellow law students, thought it was all about the courts. And we studied Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston and all those precedents, which slowly chipped away at separate but equal by starting with law schools and then moving up to public elementary schools. So what you, you just told us that it's public opinion ultimately that matters, but take us through the separate roles of the interacting roles of the courts and the protesters. What was it that allowed Thurgood Marshall and his heroic colleagues to change the mind of the Supreme Court in the years between the 40s and culminating Brown in 1954 and afterward? And how important was their role in contributing to this shift in public opinion? Well, that's critical. And it's a point that is often overlooked when we think about 
um, the legal challenges and the legal battle to bring about uh, equality, to make the Constitution apply to all people, sometimes we begin that with opening arguments. And that's where we start. Uh, but if you really want to understand how that effort begins, then you have to connect, just as you were saying, the lawyers with the people. Uh, my, I have an older brother who's two years older who is a lawyer. And we would have, as he was going through law school and I was going to graduate school, and he's saying, it's the lawyers. And I'm like, it's the people. He's like, it's the lawyers. I'm like, it's the people, right? And the truth is, it's both, yeah. right? Because you don't get the, um, uh, th that collection of five cases um, that would wind up being the Brown, combined together in Brown et al. versus uh, the Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, without the students striking in Virginia, uh, without grassroots organizers creating a case in uh, Clarendon County, South Carolina. Um, so the people are always involved. Uh, uh, Charles Hamilton Houston, who we mentioned earlier, uh, working with his prized pupil, Thurgood Marshall, who would become, of course, the first uh, African-American on the Supreme Court. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, when they're beginning to target segregation and, and, and segregated schools and say, you know, the separate, but trying to make the argument that, all right, you want to play this game of separate but equal, then you have to equalize. And, and you know that's not possible, then eventually we can say that it's fundamentally unequal and therefore unconstitutional. But they drive, they, you know, he, Charles Hamilton Houston sends Thurgood Marshall, uh, you know, with a video camera and they head down to the South and they're driving through the South, talking to people, documenting what's going on, and then trying to get plaintiffs to sign on to all of these cases when it's dangerous to do so. To put your name on that docket meant that you would face, you would face, not could face, face, you would face reprisals. You would face the possibility of losing a job, having a loan call due, and eventually violence. And so it was a real risk. But people and communities come together and raise their hand and say, we will take that risk because it's worth it. And then you combine that, the determination and the will of people on the ground, everyday people whose names we often forget. We remember Linda Brown, the little girl whose name becomes Brown. But there's thousands of Linda Browns and her parents who are saying, look, we got to do this paired with the legal brilliance of a Charles Hamilton Houston uh, and, a, and a Thurgood Marshall uh, and, and so many others that, that you're able then to get these cases at, like, as you said, don't just, aren't just litigated overnight or a year or two, but this was a quarter century building towards this. And to have that vision, where can we be perhaps in 20 years to fight this is really phenomenal. So, it, so, so I hate to say that my brother was right, but he was, but I was also right too. The people and the courts, you were absolutely both right. And, it, right. and it's the uh, relation between the two, and it's often a complicated dynamic that allowed the promise of the civil rights movement to uh, succeed. Uh, the law professor Michael Klarman has a great book from Jim Crow to Civil Rights, The Supreme Court and the Struggle for Racial Equality, which talks about the relation between the people and the courts and suggests, as, as you did, that uh, Brown was building on changes in public opinion uh, that included the integration of the military during World War II, um, but Brown was not enough. It took those pictures in Birmingham, it took the marches in Selma, it took the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, and ultimately the executive decision of the Health and Human Services Department in 1968 to threaten to withhold federal funds from schools that didn't desegregate to make meaningful change. That's one summary. If you were, when we, we have to begin to wrap up and I wanna uh, get some closing thoughts and questions. If you're gonna try to encapsulate for our friends who are watching that interaction between the courts and the people, you know, I don't know, between Brown and, and, and the end of the 1960s, what, what, what kind of story would you tell? I think, it, I think it connects to, um, or it's a parallel story to what we saw when we were thinking about sort of upholding segregation and upholding desegregation. So in, in, in that instance, in terms of the obstacles, the opposition to extending uh, full civil rights and civil liberties to African-Americans, we see the courts sometimes leading the way um, in creating these obstacles and then sometimes reflecting and reinforcing. Uh, Plessy, v, Plessy v. Ferguson did not create Jim Crow. 
Plessy v. Ferguson was like, is Jim Crow okay? Is segregation okay? And the court says, yeah, go ahead. And then it leads to another level of it. It's the same thing when it comes to sort of civil rights. Sometimes it's the court taking the lead and, 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 and pushing once given the question. But often it's sort of activists on the ground forcing the issue, saying you have to deal with this. Like we are going to make you, uh, you know, take a stand. There was an old uh, 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 civil rights song um, that was an old uh, Negro spiritual called Which Side Are You On? And they would march and they were saying, which side are you on, boy? Which side are you on? And, and that's what they were asking the courts. Which side are you on? Are you on the side of, the demo of democracy? Are you on the side of the Constitution? And they were pressing that issue. Now, it was risky to be part of, we go back to, you know, Brown. The reason why the, you finally get this direct assault on segregation, as you were saying, on the public schools in 1954 and 1955 and not 1935, because if they asked that question, which side are you on? It would have been like, the courts were like, we're on the side of segregation. I mean, so it takes this, it takes a while, you know, for the environment to change for the, all those reasons that you were talking about. But then finally, when you get to, so, you know, something like you know, 1968 or 1965, you that legislative, that legislation, you know, on the books and the courts upholding that legislation saying, yes, this is what it means. This is okay. We have to stop discriminating and the like. You know, then the courts, there's that moment where the courts are leading, right? And, and really become an, an, an ally uh, of the movement. Now, there's no guarantee that it stays like that. And we see at different moments, even after we get through the heyday of uh, the federal courts really being active to preserve uh, basic civil rights and human rights, that it then begins to move away from that. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't say we are now living during a time uh, where the courts uh, are once again uh, to go back to Giles v. Harris a century ago, are throwing up its hands, saying that, well, that's kind of up to you. We just saw the court do that with gerrymandering, right? Saying, ah, yeah, we can't really get involved, these state legislatures, that's on, that's on your territory. Well, you know, we've done, which is ironic because we've now, gerrymandering, of course, is how you draw these district lines to favor one party over another, which African-Americans and people of color are often uh, disadvantaged because of it. And the irony is the court, the Supreme Court, the Roberts Court saying, hey, you know, we can't do anything with gerrymandering. Let the state courts and state legislature deal with that. Well, they're the ones that created the gerrymandering in the first place. And so, you know, it's again that we're kind of in this moment where the court to be generous is putting its hands up uh, to be more critical, we would say, is actually aiding and abetting uh, the a retrenchment. Uh, in, in, in creating inequality in American society today. Wow, well, I'm gonna ask a, a kind of summation question from the incredible questions that are in the chat. And I know Curry will wanna ask some, some final questions too, but uh, first of all, we have an incredible observation from Zamora Barron who says, I attended segregated schools in Virginia all the way up to 1965. Brown versus Board of Education started something, but it did not end segregation in schools again, the law was not enforced. And uh, that is such a powerful personal illustration of the point you're making. And then Bonnie Zedek asks, given all that, how do you sustain involvement in a movement that goes on and on over a person's lifetime and beyond to sustain the momentum that will lead courts to enforce the law and the constitution? Well, to take the second question first, I will actually the two work together because what we saw with the first point is that this isn't something that just happened in the past and then is over. Uh, this is an ongoing, right? I mean, the, 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 the quest, the struggle to obtain and secure and maintain basic civil rights and human rights to protect uh, everyone's civil liberties is not, a, is, is not something that just uh, you achieve once and then it's over, right? I mean, constitutional rights have to constantly be protected. Uh, and that means, and this ties in, I think, to the, to the second question, you know, how do you sustain the momentum and the energy that is necessary uh, to keep the pressure on uh, all branches of government to preserve and protect? That is very difficult. Uh, we often think about um, the civil rights movement as just, a, a, as one sort of being a, a, a something that is constant in terms of its energy and development. And we also think about it looking back, 
And so for the students, I need you to know this and be clear that, that everybody participated in the civil rights movement. Everybody who was you know, denied the right to vote was out marching and, and every, all white people of goodwill were supporting and they were right there too. Uh, no, right? <laughs> that, that was not the case. It's actually only a handful of people, a small percentage are willing to uh, participate because it's dangerous, it's risky, um, you know, and, and, and they're scared and they're afraid and there's no guarantee that you will succeed. Uh, and so it's only a handful of people, small, a small number percentage wise. But it's important to note that that small number made a big difference. But that also means that it is hard to sustain social movements. Like we, we like you don't have social movements that last for a decade or 20 years or 30 years. There, you know, they might last for a year or two at a local area, at a local, at a, in a local place. That's why what we saw last summer, Jeffrey, was so, was so historic to see that many people following the killing of George Floyd, tens of millions of people take to the streets for a sustained period of time, literally tens of millions for months. That is, we've never seen that before in US history. But also when we look to the streets today, you don't see those numbers out there. But just because you don't see the numbers doesn't mean that you still don't have a dedicated cadre of people who are still working, who are still working for change, who are working uh, to get the courts to protect and preserve those basic rights. And that's where the momentum is sustained. It's not always sustained with the mass marches because that just takes too much energy uh, for people on a daily basis. But there's always, there always has been a, a, a small group of people who have committed and dedicated their lives to change and they never go away. And that those folk, uh, whether they were student nonviolent coordinating committee organizers, SNCC organizers in the 1960s who were 20 years old then, and who are 80 years old now and still fighting. We just lost John Lewis. He never stopped fighting from the sit-ins in Nashville in 1969 to standing in Black Lives Matter Plaza in 2020. He never stopped. And there's folk like him who never stop that keep that momentum going even when the cameras turn away. So that there, when there is that moment, Jeffrey, like you pointed out, those moments that are captured on film and then the people, the masses, you know, sort of get triggered and are like, wait a minute, we got to do something. Then the folk who have been doing that work all along are there saying, OK, we've been waiting for you. This is what we need to do. Wow. So powerfully put. Um, so inspiring. Uh, Curry, I know that we need to wrap up in a moment. Do you do we have to, do you want to uh, give Professor Jeffries a final question or do you want to uh, sum up and, uh, and, and say thanks? Of course, I'm going to give one more question because I just love this topic. But it, it brings me back to the, the same question that I always have. And Victoria asked it in the Q&A as well. Um, why don't we talk about this more? Why? How can we teach this better and, and learn and like learn it better too? Like it's not we're teaching ourselves, not just teaching our students or our family members. But Victoria puts it great in the, the Q&A what's the best way to teach this? I have a toddler and I wanna make sure that I'm doing it the right way. And I wanna make sure I'm presenting this in ways um, that it don't erase differences, but really understand the whole thing. And I know you do this so well. So give us, give us some theory and practice to follow in how we learn this and how we teach it. I think, well, first, Victoria, thank you for that question. That's a question that we all uh, wrestle with. It's a question that we all struggle with. Uh, I'm not only a professor, I'm also a father. Uh, and I have three, three, three beautiful uh, daughters, five, eight, and 10. Uh, and I'm always struggling to figure out, well, how do I explain this? What they're seeing, what they're, what, what they're asking me. Um, one is we have to be truthful. You know, part of the reason why we don't actually uh, talk about this or teach this in the classroom is not, a, is not because the kids don't want to learn about it. It's because we don't want to talk about it, right? Like, like that's a us problem. I once was on a plane and, and I, I hadn't had my first child yet and I was randomly sitting, this is when we used to fly and talk to people. And, 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 and a parent sat next to me, he's like, oh, you're about to have your kids, it's great. And he said, one time he took his, he, he took his child to the pediatrician and, 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 and he was saying that the pediatrician, or he was telling the pediatrician, well, you know, I can't get the kid to eat, they can't get the kid to eat. And you know, when, when we want him to, when we want him to. And then the pediatrician said, well, is he sleeping? He said, yeah. He said, you know, his weight's okay, yeah, his height okay. He said, well, that sound, that's not a him problem. That's a you problem, right? That, 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 that's on you. You're not doing something. You got an issue with that. The kid's fine. That's, a, that's us. The fact that we don't teach this history the way it actually happened 
uh, is an us problem because we're uncomfortable with it. We're uncomfortable with what happened in the past in part because the ways in which it continues to this day and also because what it says about us today, we have never been a perfect union. We have never been that. And sometimes we haven't even been trying to get there. Right? We've, been tr we've been purposefully trying to keep us from being that perfect union. The civil rights movement is about trying to get us there. Uh, and we can't be afraid to, uh, to talk about that. Not only those who try to achieve it, but those who try to keep it from being that. And the way we do that, it begins in our classrooms with the youngest learners. It begins at home with our kids just saying, hey, we have to talk about this. We haven't been perfect. We have had a lot of flaws. Racism is real. It exists. It manifests itself in personal ways and structural ways. But race isn't real, right? That's a fiction. That's a fabrication, something we came up with. We have to tell our kids the truth. Like They're cool with it. They want to know. But we have to have the courage to match their interest and their intellect. And if we start doing that now, then we'll be better off, not just as individuals, but we'll be better off, I think, as a nation down the road. Thank you. And I, it all stop, ends with we should probably just listen to the students because they're pretty good. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Jeffries. This was an amazing way to wrap up this week. And we'll be, you know, teaching the civil rights movement and the freedom movement throughout all of our courses throughout the year. And just remember, teachers out there, I put it in the chat. Professor Jeffries is going to come back this summer for our teacher institutes at the Constitution Center. So if you want to spend a whole day with him just for the teachers and the educators, you can do that as well. Thank you so much, Professor Jeffries. Jeff. Thank you so much for leading these questions. And I love the way we wrap the courts and the people together. I've never really thought of it that way. So thank you both for such an enlightening Friday. And I really appreciate it. Any final words, Jeff? Just thanks so much, Professor Jeff. It's so inspiring. And thanks for uh, inspiring all of us to learn more about the crucial relationship between the law and the people and how we can become a more perfect and just society. I can't wait to reconvene soon. And thanks for all the great light you're spreading. Have a great Absolutely. Day. Absolutely. Thanks so much. And good luck, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Have you. A good